Good evening. Uh, I hope all of you are awake and looking forward to this session. We have a special guest this evening. Nidish, you look after some iconic brands. You have a stable of 40 brands. Um, of course, we know which the bigger ones are. Is there a favorite brand of yours amongst them? The biggest is definitely the most favorite, which is Dettol. Uh, but uh, we have some emerging favorites as well. We've got one which is very small but very exciting, Durex. I think, I don't know if you have young people in this audience, but uh, Durex is a great brand to work on. Uh, then we have some brands that break the monotony. We have uh, brands like Ichgard, Ringard, Crack, that perhaps you haven't heard of, but can be quite fun to manage. I'm glad you say I haven't heard of them. <laughs> if you said I've heard of them, then it'd be politically incorrect. Today, as you know, at the Marketing White Book, the theme is the connected consumer and how did digital is changing the marketing landscape and the business landscape and how brands and digital are being intermeshed and connected. Do you think that in the next three to five years, and I'm not going to use a horizon of 18 to 24 months, FMCG products would be bought online? And if yes, what kind of percentage from the existing numbers you'd see? So currently the percentage is very small. It's less than half a percent. So half a percent of FMCG grocery products are sold online in India, 0.3%. Uh, the predictions in India are that could be anything between 3 and 5% in the next five years. The market really, if you want basically an outperformance market, China moved from this level of 0.3 to 0.5 to 15 in less than seven years. So currently for some of our categories, and you know, some categories clearly lend themselves much more to online sales than others, uh, we could have as much as 30% of our business coming from online sales, mostly mobile commerce, not e-commerce. And I would say that it is a competitive advantage because companies that have missed that trick uh, in China, for example, are declining at 10 or 15%. Big companies, I won't name them, some of them are my competitors. And we're doing very well and we're growing at about 30%. You know, throughout the afternoon, there's been a theme that this growth is coming from B-class and C-class towns, that the consumer in the B-class, C-class town is actually using digital much more, or as much as uh, the urban consumer uh, in the product portfolio and the brand portfolio that you handle. And overall, do you see this trend getting accentuated in terms of the, this base increasing primarily because of this B-class, C-class consumer, or is it going to happen from a, the urban consumer? I think in our category so far, most of the business definitely still comes from the bigger cities, right? So clearly there's a lot of uh, evangelism that's happening in basically online grocery, you know, some brands, Big Basket, et cetera, doing very well. Uh, those of you that live in Gurgaon, you're already seeing Grofers. That is something that is, you know, basically going to catch on big time. Uh, for a lot of the categories where e-commerce itself is much bigger at the moment, I'm sure a lot of the traffic is orders are coming from the smaller towns. And, you know, I think we were, we were talking about this before we came in. Even for some of our categories where physically it is not possible to distribute into much smaller towns, you know, one category in particular, sexual well-being, we get almost 40 or 50 percent of our growth coming from the smaller towns. So, you know, people want to buy these school products. They're not available in the neighborhood Kirana, but they're definitely available on their mobile, uh, and they're not shy to order them. Price points are not a barrier. You as a leader in your company, as a leading company, what are you doing to be a force for good? You know, I, I think basically the philosophy of many businesses uh, towards philanthropy is generally to write a check and forget about it. Right, I mean, that's very easy, and in some ways it is made mandatory, let's say, by the new company law on, on CSR. If people genuinely want to do something, if they want to do good, to do well, it's a phrase that I borrow from, from somebody very famous, uh, they have to do something that's close to the purpose of their company. It's something that they really believe in, it's something that the company believes in, the brands can connect to, the employees of, of the organization can connect to, and then it becomes very meaningful. So I'll give you our example. Our example is we are a company that basically believes that uh, we, are, we, we exist to make people's lives healthier, more hygienic, so that they can be happier. If we start from this space and then we look at the brands that can possibly do that, you know, clearly the brand that would spring to mind straight away in India is Dettol. Uh, 
we have an opportunity over the last 12 months to associate with a big national cause, Swachh Bharat. Swachh Bharat. The purpose of the company, the role of the brand, the national purpose, all come together uh, to form a great opportunity for us to do something that is doing good to people so that eventually we will do well. So let's not shy away from that fact, which is you know nobody is going to do something that eventually doesn't lead to commercial good, but that's not the, you know, the immediate objective. It's not as if you, know, you spend one rupee and you get the nine or 10 rupees or whatever it is very soon, but if you do something that's close to your purpose and that leads to building of categories and consumption, three, five, 10 years, you know, you're, you're achieving both objectives. You know, basically, you are doing good and you will eventually do well. Now, as a large company that spends lots of money on marketing, or let's say, reasonable amount of money. No, large, that. large, you're right. Large. Yeah. No, uh, for those of you who, who follow his company, his company is the only company in India, at least in India, where the agencies who are pitching for their business have to pay a fee. I don't know how many of you knew that, but their agencies have to pay a fee to pitch for their business. I think that's unique. That's a good thing, right? I'm not sure, but okay. I'm sure uh, it's an interesting and a unique thing. Uh, while we talk about this digital consumer, the connected consumer, the spends on digital are very low, especially in FMCG. They are less than 5% in almost all brands and categories that I've met, except auto, insurance and financial services, and the e-commerce category itself. Now, do you see the digital spends over the next 18 to 24 months going up? I'm sure they will, and you know, also I don't think they're as low as 5%. Uh, I'm sure that many FMCG brands spend much more than 5%. Clearly some brands and categories have relevant target audiences that lend themselves much more to, to digital targeting. Uh, it is definitely going to go up, but I also think that there was a bit of a fad, you know, that you must, without thinking, allocate X percentage of your funds towards digital because that's the place to go. I think eventually all of these considerations will always be on the same sound media principles of reach and cost and whether it is effective or not. So clearly, you know, there is a, again, I come back to the point of targeting, which is some categories definitely, you can well imagine that Durex, I come back to my example, 100%. 100% of our spends on that category are digital. Uh, because we believe that we have a very narrow audience to focus on and we can achieve basically, you know, a high effectiveness if we go digital. But some other categories where the reach has to be built up in the pop strata, the last 500 million that don't even have access to the internet, why would I spend an inordinate amount of money over that? I would not. So, you know, 3 4%. So if you had to make a prediction in terms of digital spends, two to three years from now, what percentage of marketing spends, I'm not necessarily saying wreck it bin Kieser, but marketing spend of FMCG companies, how much would be digital? You know, again, I'll just reiterate, it has to be different by category. But if you want a ballpark, you know, why should it be lower, for example, than what uh, marketing companies spend on radio? I don't think it'll so be it lower be than that. Be, yeah, I'm sure it'll be a sizable uh, number two or number three media vehicle. Uh, I don't see it really competing with TV for a long time to come. I don't know if that somehow you know, disturbs the theme of your conference, but uh, you know, I, I really think that in a place like India, we're a long way from digital being the number one uh, you know, media spend category. But again, I, I can give you references. So if you look at other countries, if you look, for example, not at the US or the UK, where naturally you would expect you know, much more, but some other developing countries like Brazil or Turkey, uh, for the same kind of mix that I'm talking about, which is 5 to 7% of spend in India, it could be as much as already 15 to 20%. And, and before he took on his South Asia role, he was in UK. And in UK, the digital spends have overtaken television spends. They're about yeah, 40%. They now. could be. 35 to 40%, percent, so, yes. Absolutely. And you know, the other very interesting thing is it's not just about cost or being you know, effective. It's also now about reach. Sometimes you can have incremental reach from digital. So, Intuitively, you would think, you know, digital is a subset, social media is a subset of TV, but there are some people that never watch TV. So if you've got kids, like I've got, you know, a 14-year-old, I can't remember the last time she watched TV. If she wants something to see, it's going to be on her laptop, right? 
exactly the same content, but it's a completely different screen. Sure. So beyond the point, you know, definitely there is also advantage of building reach through digital. It's not just supplementary, you know, basically frequency. So do you see a day in five years from now where digital in India would become the primary medium or mobile? Frankly, uh, what, advertising? Yes. No. I don't see it as being the primary medium. I see it as being very, very significant. Uh, I think we're a long way from, from being the primary. Also, you know, I think it's, it's a simple question of where is most of the advertising money in India going to go if it's about bringing consumers into categories for the first time. In a country like India, you would say penetration is generally, you know, the first objective. Uh, you're generally going to look beyond the first three or 400 million people. But in those cases, most of those people may not have television because they don't have electricity, but may have a mobile phone. True. And probably the True. mobile commerce or consumption of brands through mobile will happen. I, I agree, I, absolutely. And there are some very interesting uh, prize winning award. Again, some competitors of mine, the fantastic stuff that they have Khan done. Khan Kajura. Exactly. Everyone seems to know this, right? right? Khan Kajura Tesen. Uh, absolutely incredible idea to reach media dark places through mobile. It was fantastic. So we, we are talking of digital, we are talking of earned media, we are talking of how brands and companies can use digital to increase sales, increase brand sales. But as we've seen in recent times, controversies and digital can really amplify the controversy and they can really damage the brand, the business overnight. As a leader of a business and not just as a marketer, what do you feel is the role of a leader in a, in a controversy? Well, you know, whether it's a leader or anyone experiencing a controversy, I think the worst thing that you can possibly do in a situation like that is to run away from it on any kind of digital media. You must be part of the conversation, right? So if, if there's a whole conversation happening around perhaps a negative, you know, event that has affected your brand or your company, if you're not part of that conversation, you know, there is going to be a whole lot of uh, negative sentiment that, you know, you cannot even bring your positive thoughts to. So you can't run away from that. I think at the same time, uh, responsibility needs to be carefully controlled in a situation like this because generally you would have very young marketeers running your, you know, digital communication, especially on the social media side, and some of them, you know, could be trigger happy. And in a situation like this, it is very important to make sure that you have the right people, uh, you know, manning all of your communication, maybe filtering it a little bit. Uh, you know, it comes, with, it comes with that challenge as well. It's literally a double-edged sword. Yeah, it is. You bring me to another point. I keep saying that, and I said that when I started the conference, is that, you know, marketing and brand building is too important to be left to the CMO. Do you agree with that? especially in today's digital age? If my CMO were, was here, he would probably, you know, look at you and say, not very vigorously, <laughs> yeah. I don't think that, you know, the primary responsibility of building brands and businesses is only the CMOs. I mean, you know, there are many other places, uh, people that, that should be involved. Actually, I'm a great believer in the, in the power of go-to-market organizations to build the brand as well, which is sales, right? So go-to-market is maybe a, a nice new way to describe, you know, sales. But the impact that their actions in store, in the way that you can come across to consumers and shoppers, uh, you know, that impact on brand building generally tends to be ignored, and I think uh, it is very, very important. You know, you worked in a company, you're working in a company, and you worked, you're, you stayed in a company for 22 years. This is your 23rd year? Yeah. This is your 23rd year. When we're talking of the millennials, we're talking of this digital consumer, they are very unloyal, if I may use the word. In, and I'm talking in terms of brand usage, in terms of offers, you know. How do you deal with a mindset which is totally new? I know you have kids and I know you observe consumer behavior, but as a marketer, as a leader, how do you deal with this very unloyal audience? So, of course, the first point that you're making is I'm too old to understand young consumers. No, no, sir. Maybe not. Uh, no, I'm not making <laughs> yeah. I'm But, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's really by, by observing, by participating, uh, you know, first of all, to understand a completely different demographic. 
But in terms of their loyalty behavior, I really don't think they're any different from the kinds of consumers and shoppers we've always had. Choice was limited. Right. Choice is much more. Right. right, but the propensity of consumers to always look for choices, limited though they may, you know, it may have been, was always there. You always dealt with, you know, basically a situation where you had to convince someone to buy your brand versus another brand. Uh, I think the the change, if you like, is very clear, straight comparisons are possible on many parameters in front of your eyes when it comes to digital. Right, so if I was somebody that was buying an expensive TV, for example, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I would be forced to go to a couple of shops, compare, I would miss some information, and therefore I may make my choice on the basis of very limited visibility. Now, all I go, I go to you know, one of the big marketplace things, say TV, 42 inch, whatever it is, and straight away I can see all of the information that I need to see, brand, specs, price, sort by price, and suddenly, it is much more difficult for you know, a brand to be out there hiding in some way you know, through their distribution reach or their advertising muscle because a lot more choice data is now available. So of course, it's more difficult, but still, choice was always important.